Welcome to my talk on gender-sensitive curriculum and feminist pedagogy. One of the most important reasons for this topic is that, quote, feminism recognizes education both as a site for struggle and as a tool for change-making, end quote. This presentation will cover, one, interlocking forces of race, class, and gender, two, the inclusion of women in the curriculum, three, influences of media on identity, four, student resistance and cognitive dissonance, and then we'll have time for suggestions and questions. Sometimes teachers can inadvertently assign requirements for classes that have unequal impact on students. The following requirements or assignments have actually been used at my university. I will only discuss a couple because of our time limitations. One, the requirement in an education class that students spend two weeks at an outdoor camp. And another assignment where PhD students are required to complete a summer of field work with their advisors. These assignments cause many non-traditional students tremendous difficulty because they may have family responsibilities to consider or other work responsibilities. We have a policy in our art education program where students must not have paid employment while they're student teaching. Again, the need to be a primary wage earner for a family may make this option impossible for some students. The United States members of the audience will recognize these non-traditional representations of our past president and vice president and our current president. These pictures illustrate the need to be clear about what we mean when we discuss gender. Sex is defined as an assignment based upon the look of genitalia at birth. Gender, however, is the cultural identification of a person based upon naming, dress, and the use of other markers such as social and aesthetic discourses. Therefore, a person could be identified as a particular sex and have a different gender identity. Many people self-identify someplace in between the strong dichotomies of male and female, arguing that there are more than two genders. Throughout recorded time, girls and women have been accorded less cultural value than boys and men. One of the most revered spiritual leaders in history, Martin Luther, wrote in 1533, Girls begin to talk and to stand on their feet sooner than boys because weeds grow more quickly than good crops. Philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer wrote in 1851, Instead of calling them beautiful, there would be more warrant for describing women as the unesthetic sex. Neither for music, nor for poetry, nor for the fine art have they really and truly any sense of susceptibility. Pythagoras, in the 6th century BCE, wrote, There is a good principle which created order, light, and man, and an evil principle which created chaos, darkness, and women. Even Aristotle, it seems, had a problem with women. He said, It is absurd to argue from an analogy with wild animals and say that men and women ought to engage in the same occupations, for animals do not do housework. The women's movements around the world have attempted to renegotiate the reputations and powers of women, as well as arguing for a cultural basis to identity development. One strong role model for women is the philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote in 1953, quote, One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. It is civilization as a whole that produces this creature, which is described as feminine. In spite of the work of feminist philosophers and activists, in the United States, dominant white patriarchal ideology is normative. 
This picture shows two images from television shows that were popular in the 1960s and have left their mark on the United States culture. They picture ideal families with the father in, the con in control. Father knows best. So you're the little lady who invented the wheel. Do tell me more. This picture shows a cave person cocktail party where a woman has admitted to inventing the wheel. Why is this so amusing? Is it impossible that a woman could have invented something so important to civilization? The education situation, which most effectively promotes significant learning, is one in which the threat to the self of the learner is reduced to a minimum and differential perception of the field experience is facilitated. Media and identity. This artwork by the American artist Barbara Kruger tells us your body is a battleground. It is a similar message as the previous slide of images by Mitch Kern. The media informs our identity as surely as our mirrors. Stereotypes of masculinity and femininity go back to myths associated with religious doctrine. We could deconstruct this image for hours, but briefly, the story of Adam and Eve has impacted cultures throughout the world. The philosopher Samuel Butler echoed biblical tenets when he wrote in 1605, The souls of women are so small that some believe they have none at all. These myths impact our ways of looking at teaching and learning. As A. Cheryl Curtis, 1998, argues, we need to acknowledge the stories that inform our curriculum and identities. The inclusion of our historical and social locations as they relate to power, oppression, and privilege has the potential to be a compelling component in the construction of curriculum. The gendered practices of everyday life reproduce society's view of how women and men should act. Inclusive educational practices can empower students. Barbara Omalade, 1993, uses feminist pedagogy strategy in her classes. When I am teaching history and politics, my students can bring their experience, insights, and questions to classroom discussions. I assist them by adding the factual, analytical, and contextual information that illuminates and expands their insights. The method works well to empower students, drawing them out, helping them to make sense of what they already know and have experienced. Cultural toys. Ken turns 50 this year. Look how he's changed through the decades. Here are some of Ken's friends, action figures, not dolls. Consider the intended and unintended educational properties of these images.